This screencast covers the topic of chemical bonds. You'll find information on chemical bonds in chapter two of your textbook. The learning objectives of the screencast are as follows. Compare and contrast molecules and compounds. Explain the role of electrons in chemical bonding. Define molecules and compounds and identify examples of each. Explain each of the following bonds, ionic, nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and hydrogen bonds. And finally, define a salt and describe what occurs when a salt is placed in water. Let's start our discussion by defining molecules and compounds. A molecule by definition is two or more atoms combined chemically. We can take two hydrogen atoms, form a bond between them and form molecular hydrogen or H2. We find hydrogen in the form of molecular hydrogen in the environment, by the way. They're not free at, uh, hydrogen atoms roaming around. When you breathe in air, uh, the hydrogen that you're breathing in is actually molecular hydrogen. We'll talk later about how uh, single atoms of hydrogen are unstable and they combine with other hydrogen atoms to form molecular hydrogen. But anyway, H2 is a molecule because it contains two or more atoms that have been combined chemically. And when we say combined chemically, we mean that a bond, a chemical bond, has formed between the atoms. A compound is a two or more different atoms combined chemically. It is, in essence, a specific type of molecule. So for example, here we have four hydrogen atoms and one carbon atom, and we can form a bond between carbon and each of these hydrogen atoms to form CH4 or methane. CH4 is a compound because it is composed of two or more different atoms. We have a carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms, so we have two different types of atoms. So it is a compound. Now it is also a molecule, because remember a molecule is two or more atoms combined chemically. It doesn't matter if they're different or, or they're the same. So CH4 is also a molecule. In fact, Every compound is a molecule, but not every molecule is a compound. For example, is H2O a molecule? Yes. Is H2O a compound? Yes. What about O2, molecular oxygen? It is, is it a molecule? Is it a compound? If you said it's a molecule, you are correct because O2 molecular oxygen is composed of two oxygen atoms and by definition two or more atoms combined chemically is a molecule. If you said it is not a compound you are correct because it is composed of two of the same atoms. Therefore it is a molecule but not a compound. Now that we understand that atoms can interact with one another to form chemical bonds, let's discuss the details and how this occurs. And we, we're going to focus on the electrons. Electrons are the only subatomic particles that participate directly in bonding. This is not to say that the protons don't play a role. We're just not going to focus on them. We're going to focus on the electrons because they're the most important. Electrons, of course, are found outside of the nucleus. And in this example, we're looking at neon, which has an atomic uh, number of 10. And so it has 10 protons. And atoms are electrically neutral. And so if they've got 
10 protons, it also means they have 10 electrons. And these electrons are found in specific areas of space outside the nucleus called energy levels or electron shells. We can see that uh, the first energy level contains two electrons and the second energy level here in of the atom neon contains eight electrons. The process of bonds forming or bonds being broken are referred to as chemical reactions. Chemical bonds can form between atoms to form a molecule as shown here, where two hydrogen atoms combine chemically to form molecular hydrogen. And we often uh, indicate the bond between those atoms as a dash, particularly if it's a covalent bond, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And chemical bonds may be broken and new bonds formed between different atoms. So here we have two molecules of water. And if we run electricity through water, we can actually break the bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen and then form new bonds between the oxygen atoms and bonds between the hydrogen atoms. This is how uh, industrially hydrogen is actually formed. They'll run electricity through water and it'll break those bonds between oxygen and hydrogen and then bonds will form between the hydrogen atoms and bonds between the oxygen atoms. So I mentioned that electrons are found in regions of space outside the nucleus called energy shells or energy levels. What I did not mention was that each energy shell can hold a maximum number of electrons uh, to achieve stability. The first energy level can hold a maximum of two electrons. So this is helium. It only has two protons. Therefore, it only has two electrons. And so it's got two electrons in its outer shell. And this outer shell can only, this first shell is its outer shell. It can only hold two electrons and it has two electrons. So it is chemically stable. Neon has 10 protons and therefore 10 electrons. It has two electrons in its first energy level. Remember I said that the first energy level can hold a maximum of two. And it's got eight electrons in its outer shell, which is the second energy level. And it, the, the second energy level can hold at most eight electrons. And it has electrons, so it also is chemically stable. Elements or atoms that are chemically stable will not interact and form bonds with other atoms. That is why you've never heard of the compound helium chloride or helium iodide or helium cyanide or helium anything because helium will not chemically react with other atoms. Why? Because its outer electron shell is full. Same thing with neon. Neon's outer shell is full, so it will not chemically react with other atoms. Again, while you've never heard of neon chloride or neon iodide or neon sulfate, etc. As I mentioned, each energy level or shell can hold a maximum number of electrons and the electrons fill the innermost shell first. Carbon has six protons and therefore six electrons. So it's got two in its inner shell because that's the maximum amount it can hold. And then it's got four in its outer shell, the second shell. The second shell can hold eight but it only has four because the first two go into the first shell. Sodium 
has 11 protons and then therefore 11 electrons to fill the inner most shell first, the first energy level, then the eight fill the second, and then the remaining one goes in the third. So notice that the outer shell of carbon is not full. It can hold eight, but it only has four. Same with sodium. Its outer shell can hold eight to be stable, but it only contains one. So unlike neon and helium, these outer shells are not full and therefore they will interact and have and engage in chemical reactions with other atoms because they're not chemically stable. They don't have a uh, outer shell that's full. Going back to helium and neon, Again, they have outer shells that are full. Another name for the outer shell of an atom is the valence shell. Atoms that have full outer shells do not react chemically with other atoms. They do not form molecules with other atoms. Helium and neon, along with the other elements, in group eight of the periodic table are referred to as noble gases because they don't they don't fool around with other elements they don't form bonds and molecules with other elements however all the other elements their atoms do not have full outer shells they have unfilled valence shield and therefore they are chemically unstable that is they will react with other atoms in order to fill their outer shells in some cases they will gain an electron to fill their outer shell in other cases they'll lose an electron to fill their outer shell and in other cases they'll share electrons in other to in order to fill their outer shells Hydrogen, in this example, uh, has only one electron in its outer shell. It wants two. So sometimes it'll give up that electron. Sometimes it'll receive an electron. Sometimes it'll share an electron. Carbon has four electrons in its outer shell. It wants eight. Typically, it's not going to lose four electrons or, uh, or, or receive four. It'll typically share electrons with other atoms. Oxygen, six electron in its outer shell. It wants two. Typically, it'll share electrons with other atoms. And sodium has one electron in its outer shell. What do you think it's going to do? Yeah, it tends to just give up that one, and then it has a full outer shell. Now, I want to be clear. I am not going to show you a, a atom and ask you, well, this atom form bonds by giving up electron or receiving electron or sharing electron. I'm not going to ask you that question. I'm also not going to ask you how many atoms each shell can hold. The whole purpose of this discussion on where electrons are found and that uh, each energy level can hold a maximum number of electrons, and if it does, it's chemically stable, is only to explain why atoms form chemical bonds in the first place, or why certain atoms, such as neon and helium, don't. Neon and helium don't because they have full outer shells, so they will not form bonds. All the other atoms, such as hydrogen, carbon, sodium, oxygen, um, will, will form bonds. It's also why you don't have free hydrogen atoms in the air. We don't breathe free hydrogen atoms. Why? Because when they run into, when they collide with other hydrogen atoms, they form bonds and form molecular hydrogen. Same thing with oxygen, right? We breathe in O2. Why don't we breathe in individual oxygen atoms? Well, because Oxygen atoms in the air, when they collide with one another, they form molecular oxygen because they're unstable.
Now that you understand why atoms form chemical bonds with other atoms to achieve chemical stability, let's look at the different chemical reactions and the different types of bonds that are formed. An ionic bond is formed when electrons are completely transferred from one atom to the other. In this example, we're looking at the a chemical reaction between sodium atom, chlorine atom to form sodium chloride, table salt. So let's look at sodium. Sodium has one electron in its outer shell. Is it chemically stable? No. Chlorine has two, four, six, seven electrons in its outer shell. Is it chemically stable? No. Sodium, to achieve chemically st chemical stability, is going to transfer that one electron to chlorine. When it does that, now sodium has a full outer shell. And what's now called chloride has a full outer shell. So they're now chemically stable. However, we no longer have a atom of sodium and chlorine as we had here. Our products include a sodium ion and a chloride ion and a compound called sodium chloride. Now pause this video and watch the short YouTube video I posted to Blackboard on ionic bonding. Now let's look a little closer at this. So sodium atom had a neutral charge, right? It had 11 protons and it had 11 electrons. So it had a neutral charge. Chlorine atom had 17 protons, 17 electrons. Electrons are negatively charged. Once the sodium atom donated one of its electrons to chlorine, it was no longer electrically neutral, nor was chlorine. Because sodium lost an electron, it now has 11 protons, but only 10 electrons. So it has a net positive charge. Chlorine had 17 protons, 17 electrons, and it gained ele an electron. So now it has 18 electrons and 17 protons. So it has a net negative charge. And by convention, we no longer refer to it as chlorine atom but chloride ion because the sodium ion is positively charged and the chloride ion is negatively charged they are attracted to one another remember something that's positively charged is attracted to something that's negatively charged and something that's negatively charged is attracted to something that's positively charged right so they're attracted to one another so where one goes the other goes and this in essence is an ionic bond when we look at a block of table salt what you're actually seeing is these alternating sodium and chloride ions. Where the chloride is attracted to the sodium and the sodium ions are attracted to the chloride ions. Here's some definitions for you. A positively charged ion such as sodium ion is called a cation a negatively charged ion such as chloride ion is called an anion commit the terms cation and anion to memory compounds formed by ionic bonding are called salts 
So all of these compounds here, sodium fluoride, magnesium oxide, potassium chloride, and sodium chloride are salts. We specifically refer to sodium chloride as table salt because we use it to season our food. Notice that a crystal of sodium chloride or table salt is formed by the alternating ions of sodium and chloride or of these anions and cations. When a salt such as sodium chloride is placed in water, the water basically pulls apart these ions. And so we have ions in solution, which we often refer to as electrolytes. We'll talk uh, a little later about what, why water does this and the significance of this. Atoms can also become stable by gaining a full outer shell by sharing electrons. In this example, we're going to look at the sharing of a pair of electrons by two hydrogen atoms. So hydrogen has the atomic number one. So it has one proton and it has one electron. Its outer shell can hold two electrons, so it's chemically unstable. So what will happen is two hydrogen atoms will share a pair of electrons, as shown here. Now that they're sharing a pair of electrons, both have two electrons in their outer shell and now are stable. The sharing of one pair of electrons is called a single covalent bond. This is also why we don't find individual hydrogen atoms in, uh, in the air. We find molecular hydrogen because hydrogen atoms are unstable and when two hydrogen atoms run into one another, they form a covalent bond. This is just another example of the formation of a molecule uh, by the sharing of electrons between different atoms. Here we're looking at the formation of methane or CH4. Here we have a carbon atom which has four electrons in its outer shell and we have hydrogen atoms again with one electron in each of their outer shells. Well, each of the, these hydrogen atoms can share its electron with carbon. Carbon has four electrons in its outer shell. It, it needs eight to be neutral. And so carbon will share one of these electrons with each of those hydrogen atoms, forming a single covalent bond with each hydrogen atom. And so now we have the formation of the molecule methane and methane is also a compound because it contains two or more different elements. We also can represent each of these covalent bonds in the structural in the structural formula by little dashes. Sometimes atoms share more than one pair of electrons, such is the case in the formation of molecular oxygen. Here we have two oxygen atoms. They each have six electrons in their outer shell. They want eight. And so they will share not one, but two pairs of electrons. And we have what's called a double covalent bond. 
in some cases, atoms can actually share three pairs of electrons, such as the case when the formation of molecular nitrogen. Here we have nitrogen with five electrons in their outer shell. They're going to share three pairs of electrons to get a full outer shell. And we have formation of a uh, triple covalent bond. So in summary, I gave you three examples of how atoms can become chemically stable by sharing electrons. When atoms share electrons, covalent bonds are formed. Atoms can share one, two, or three pairs of electrons to form single, double, or triple covalent bonds. Pause this video and watch the animation on covalent bonding that I have posted to Blackboard. It will summarize what I just talked about and it will also introduce the concept of nonpolar and polar covalent bonding. In the examples of covalent bonding that I introduced, the electrons were shared equally between the atoms. When electrons are shared equally in the formation of a covalent bond, that bond is referred to as being nonpolar and it is electrically neutral, or the, mo the molecule rather is electrically neutral. So here in this example, we have carbon and we have oxygen and they're sharing their electrons equally. So we have a nonpolar molecule. It is electrically neutral. Let's contrast that with a water molecule. And a water molecule, you have one oxygen atom and you have two hydrogen atoms. And the oxygen shares a pair of electrons with each of the two hydrogen atoms, but it does not share the electrons equally. It hogs the electrons. In other words, those electrons spend more time around the oxygen atom than they do around the hydrogen atom. Because of that, because the electrons spend more time around the oxygen atom than they do the hydrogen atom, the oxygen has a slight negative charge, or I should say the water molecule has a slight negative charge on the oxygen end, and a slight positive charge on the hydrogen end. This type of bond is almost an ionic bond. Recall that with an ionic bond, the electron is donated from one atom to the other, never to return. And the atom that donates the electron is positive because it lost an electron. And the oxygen, excuse me, and the atom that gains the electron is negative because it gained an electron. It has more electrons than it has, than it has protons. In this case, it's not that one is donated to the other, it's just that it spends more time around one atom, in this case, the oxygen, compared to the hydrogen. And so you have a slight negative charge on the oxygen end of the water molecule, which we indicate by a delta negative, and slight positives on the hydrogen end, which we indicate by a delta plus. This is not something that you are required to know, but I wanted to give you some explanation as to why polar covalent bonds form between hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen has an atomic number of eight. That means it has eight protons. Hydrogen has an atomic number of one, meaning it has one protons. Recall that protons are positively charged. So the oxygen atoms has eight protons pulling on these shared electrons, while hydrogen only has one proton pulling on those electrons. So 
um, oxygen is has a greater pull on these electrons than the hydrogens, and so they're going to spend more time around the oxygen atom than they do around the hydrogen atom of the molecule water. And that's why the oxygen end has a slightly negative charge, and the hydrogen ends have a slightly positive charge. Because we have this separation of charge with the oxygen end of water being slightly negative and the, pos and the hydrogen end of water being slightly positive, we have what is called a polar molecule or sometimes it's referred to as a dipole because we have opposite charges on the opposite ends of the molecule. So you may ask the question, why do we care that a water molecule is a dipole? Why do we care that the oxygen end is slightly negative and the hydrogen end is slightly positive? Well, we care because charged particles are attracted to other charged particles. So now the negative end of water, the oxygen end, is going to be attracted to toward positively charged particles. And the positive hydrogen end of water is going to be attracted to negatively charged particles, including other water molecules. And so this attraction between the negative end of a water molecule and the positive end of another water molecule forms what are called hydrogen bonds. These are weak but very important bonds, and they are responsible for the life-sustaining properties of water, which we'll be covering shortly. As I mentioned, hydrogen bonds are very weak bonds resulting from the attraction between the negatively charged oxygen end of one water molecule and the positively charged hydrogen end of another water molecule. These hydrogen bonds you're going to learn are weak but extremely important bonds. They are responsible for the structure of proteins, which you're going to learn are related to the functions of those proteins, and they're also responsible for the structure of DNA. Different molecules exhibit different degrees of polarity or separation of charge depending on the types of bonds that make up those molecules. We have uh, very low polarity or separation of charge where we have predominantly or exclusively nonpolar covalent bonds. We have a greater separation of charge if we have polar covalent bonds as part of the molecule. And where we have our greatest separation of charge or polarity is where we have a molecule formed by ionic bonding. Before we end, let's review the objectives of the screencast. Compare and contrast molecules and compounds. Explain the role of electrons in chemical bonding. Define molecules and compounds and, and identify examples of each. Explain each of the following bonds, ionic, nonpolar covalent, polar covalent, and hydrogen bonds. And lastly, define a salt and describe what occurs when a salt is placed in water.